Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we trust in you. Give us the zeal of your great saints to be outstanding men of God, not necessarily outstanding in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of you, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about this this morning about St. James the Less, subtitled that I put in, Less is More. Why is that? Okay. So which St. James are we talking about? Because if you've done any reading in the Bible, there are two listed. Okay. And so uh, first I want to look at St. James the Greater, who we're not talking about today, but we will for a minute here. Okay. Okay. Um, and when then we'll get to St. James the Less. St. James the Greater, um, or the Great, okay, was a son of Zebedee, an apostle, the brother of John the Apostle, and he was also called James the Greater, and greater because either he was called first or perhaps taller, or perhaps both. And that would distinguish him from, so height, okay, um, and somehow order in the calling uh, would distinguish him from St. James the Less. James the Lesser, a nice short man like me, praise you Jesus, we don't have to duck as much during the second coming. Okay, so... He's not diminished in greatness, however, even though he was short in stature. A little bit of it about his lineage you can trace in the Bible. Um, he was the son of Alphaeus. He was an apostle, the brother of the Lord, the son of Mary, wife of Cleophas, who was one of the women present at the cross of Christ and the brother of Joseph, or his name is Josie. And James, the brother of Jude. So he came from a pretty big family here. As the son of Alphaeus and an apostle, okay, you can find reference to that in Mark and Matthew 10, verse 13, and Mark 3, 18, in Luke 6, 15, and in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 13. All these places, uh, he is mentioned as Alphaeus, the son of Alphaeus, the apostle. Okay. The brother of the Lord, he's also named as. James, the brother of the Lord. You can find references to that for in Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, verse 3, and Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. Um, they, you can get into some semantics uh, with uh, the title, The Brother of the Lord, insofar as um, sometimes um, our evangelical brothers and sisters use that to say that um, uh, Mary had children after Jesus. But there's a, there, there is a flip-flop in the word for brother that could also mean cousin. And it seems like church tradition generally substantiates that they were more or less cousins rather than um, blood brothers. Okay. He's identified with the James of Galatians chapter 2, ver verse 2 and verse 9. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 21, and 1 Corinthians 15. 
James is the son of Mary, brother of Joseph or Jose. Mark 15, 40, the son of Mary, wife of Clophus, John 19, 25. James, the brother of Jude, Jude chapter 1, verse 1, Luke 6, 16, Acts 1, verse 13, We'll take a look here a little bit at his early life. He was raised as a pious Jew due to the Judean and Galilean culture, was most probably familiar with Greek as well as Aramaic, which bears itself in, in his writings. He was called to be an apostle with Jude. He was, he was called at the same time as the apostle Jude. He's named in all the lists of the apostles. The list in uh, Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, and the Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. The Lord appeared to him before his ascension. At the time of St. Paul, after the conversion of Paul, uh, in A.D. 37, James and Peter meet Paul in Jerusalem. And that's recorded in Galatians chapter 1 and Acts 9. In 44 A.D., after Peter escapes from prison, he asks for news of his release to be brought to James, indicating James's preeminence in Jerusalem. Okay, so and you see this connection with Peter and James. So there's a, um, there's a he's he's definitely involved in the hierarchical structure of the early church during the papacy of Peter. At the Council of Jerusalem, you remember where uh, this is where um, Saint Paul encouraged uh, the apostles to um, have respect for the Gentiles and not forcing all of the Jewish laws on them. In AD 51, uh, James as Bishop of Jerusalem determines that Gentile Christians are not bound to circumcision and the Mosaic laws. This came as a great relief for many men who were getting ready to be baptized. <laughs> His most important act was his intervention in the matter of the difficult relations between Christians of Jewish origin and those of pagan origin. In this matter, together with Peter, that's an, and that's an interesting detail, together with Peter, he contributed to overcoming or rather to integrating the original Jewish dimension of Christianity with the need with the need not to impose upon converted pagans the obligations to submit to all the norms of the laws of Moses. That's a quote from Pope Benedict. He was the first bishop of Jerusalem. James with Peter and John endorsed the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles. You might remember that um, Paul considered himself called somewhat in a different fashion than the other 12 because of his revelation on the road um, and where he was knocked off his horse, but he did have a personal encounter with the risen Christ and he was compelled into his ministry and preached for a number of years after that, but finally made his way to Jerusalem where he got the um, approval of James, Peter, and John for his ministry to the Gentiles. After Paul's third missionary mission, he visits James, who recognizes him, who, who rec he recognizes him as Bishop of Jerusalem. James, an epistle writer, the New Testament letter of James is attributed to the less. James identifies himself as a slave of God 
and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that his title, James the Less, I would, I would link with what he calls himself, a slave of God. He makes himself less. It's reminiscent of uh, John's uh, words in the Gospel of St. John the Baptist, his words in the Gospel, he must increase, I must decrease. That's a good word for all of us to constantly keep ourselves in perspective as we uh, relate to Jesus. St. James's letter shows us a very concrete and practical Christianity. And so as a, as, a, as a bishop in Jerusalem, he had a real handle on the practicalities of living the faith uh, day to day. It seems like in these writings, he was, he was definitely not um, a bishop who was in the ivory tower, but he was very well acquainted with his people and what they struggled with. Faith must be fulfilled in life above all, in love of neighbor, and especially in dedication to the poor. We were just talking about St. Vincent de Paul the other day, so we, um, we can add uh, St. James as an intercessor to our brothers in St. Vincent de Paul uh, to recruit more men, huh? So it is against this background that the famous sentence must be read as the body apart from the spirit is dead. So faith apart from works is dead. That's a, that's a line from his epistle that is often quoted. He was also called James the Just. He drank no wine, nor strong drink, nor ate animal foods, nor razor touched his head. He was respected among the Jews and made many converts in Jerusalem among the Jews. However, he was so effective, like his master, that um, alarmed by his influences, the local Jewish leaders tried to force him to repudiate Christ publicly at the temple. It's interesting in today's reading, you, uh, in today's readings for the Mass, you have the beginning of the confrontation with Saint Steve, between St. Stephen and the Jewish officials, and you see the same thing. James, in his zeal, took the opportunity, instead of repudi repudi repudiating his uh, faith in Christ, rather he gave very zealous and convincing testimony to Jesus. Of course, his persecutors uh, gave him his heart's desire, that was to die with Christ. And so, James the Martyr, A.D. 62, was martyred. He was first thrown from a pinnacle of the temple, and he survived. The fall are not killing him, they stoned him and beat him with clubs. And while praying for his, and all the while he prayed for his attackers. You see, James, the, as the martyr, as a zealous spokesman for Christ, um, he's um, a model for us all. And in his, and his, his encyclic, his, um, his epistle, in his epistle, he shows that living the life of Christ in a very practical way in your daily situations is how we act as Christians. And sometimes um, our Christianity will put us in the face of conflict where we have to make a choice. Is it better to be less with Christ and seen as less in society? Or is it better to be standing um, against society and really be with Christ and be willing to die with Christ. Um, and we may have to do that. We may be called upon to do that. So the less is really great. James urges us to abandon ourselves in the hands of God in all that we do. As he says in his epistle, if the Lord wills, that's 
one of his hallmarks. If the Lord wills, he does everything according to God's will. It's a great thing for us to strive for. Thus, he teaches us not to presume to plan our lives autonomously and with self-interest, but to make room for the inscrutable will of God who knows what is truly good for us. I'm thinking about, uh, this made me think about how many people construct their lives around their personal agenda and the fruit of that, where that takes them. This quote um, here in, on this slide is from Pope Benedict. Amen. Oh, 